Well, good morning again. Good to be with you. Glad you're here. Thanks so much for taking some time out of your weekend to join us on this Pentecost Sunday. It's the, it's the birthday, you know, of the church. Welcome. We're glad you're here. Hey, real quick, uh, good morning to Facebook. We're glad that you guys are watching us. So thanks to, to Facebook Live and those of you who happen to be uh, watching in or maybe you're listening by way of a podcast. We're glad that you're with us. When you came in this morning, uh, somebody gave you a bulletin. I would invite you to take that bulletin if you would. And on the back side, I'm going to uh, point out a couple of things real quick. Uh, there is a space for you to take some notes, grab a pen, get a Bible, get something to bear down on if you would. And I would invite you just simply take some notes this morning. Um, real quick, before we kind of jump too terribly deeply into our sermon, what I would like you to do this morning is to give attention uh, to the reading and the uh, hearing and the seeing of God's Word. You can use that microphone there, right over there. Hear now a portion of the story of God from the book that we love. Acts 2, 1 through 21. On the day of Pentecost, all of the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. When they heard the loud noise, everyone came running, and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. They were completely amazed. How can this be, they exclaimed. These people are all from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. Here we are. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, the province of Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the areas of Libya around Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, the Cretans and the Arabs. And we all hear these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things that God has done. They stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean? They asked each other. But others in the crowd ridiculed them and saying, they're just drunk, that is all. And then Peter stepped forward with the 11 other apostles and shouted to the crowd, listen carefully all of you, fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem, Make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk, as some of you are assuming. It's nine o'clock in the morning, and it's much too early for that. No, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. In those days, I will pour out my spirit, even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will all prophesy. And I will cause wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and clouds of smoke. The sun will become dark and the moon will turn blood red before that great and glorious day of the Lord arrives. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Jamie. Let's pray together. Gracious Lord, we pray that Pentecost, which happened so long ago, would happen again. But God, allow it first to happen in us. Allow the coming and the filling and the power of the Holy Spirit to be your reality in our lives. We give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Well, this morning, as we're kind of getting in and talking a little bit about uh, the Holy Spirit, this is obviously the series that we're in, and it kind of lines up really well with uh, the whole idea of power up and this idea of the power that's working within us and within our children's lives, our lives, every every Christian believer is, of course, the Holy Spirit. And so last week, we'll just kind of begin uh, by way of review. Last week, one of the things that we said was that the Holy Spirit is none other than God, We said that the Spirit is a person and that He does everything that a person can do, that He uh, thinks and He sees and He hears and He is joyful, He can be grieved, uh, that He guides and He directs and that He speaks. And, and, And yes, He speaks. He speaks and we can listen and we can hear the voice of God. Last week we noted that the Apostle Paul had written to the church in Corinth these words, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? And so when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, we are aware that, that, that God the Holy Spirit comes to live and to dwell inside of us. In other words, we are the living representation of Jesus on the earth today. God the Son can't be in more than one place at one time. He is, he is the one who has uh, never been bound by time, but allows himself to be bound by time. And so he's in one spot at one time. But through the presence of the Holy Spirit living and dwelling inside of the believer, he is now able to be in multiple places at multiple times. So consequently, the Holy Spirit no longer lives in things like tabernacles or temples or even churches. We, and the, oh, by the way, the Holy Spirit doesn't live here. He lives inside of you. He just happens to dwell here when we're all together. Remember what the the scripture says, that when two or three are gathered together in his name, there he is in the midst of them. And so the presence of the spirit of the living God dwells inside of us. He lives in his people. Thus we become the new temple. That our lives are the new temple. And so here's what I know about the Holy Spirit, and you already know this too. Grasping the concept of the Holy Spirit, God, the third person of the Trinity, or just the nature of the Trinity as a whole, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it's kind of tough. Anybody ever wrestled mentally with trying to understand this idea? Absolutely. Yeah, nobody in this section over here. we got Bible scholars all right over there. But, but it's true, but, but, but we have, we do, we wrestle with this notion and this idea. Here's, here's what I want you to see, though, this morning is simply this. Just because I can't comprehend something doesn't mean I cannot apprehend something. Comprehension is this idea of understanding. It's understanding fully, while apprehension is really uh, this, this sense of, of being aware of. Like, for example, let me illustrate it real quick. I don't comprehend the internet, but I apprehend it all the time, right? I don't comprehend electricity, but we are apprehending it in this moment. I don't comprehend the cloud. Oh, they say, oh, it's in the cloud. Where the heck is the cloud? Like, I just don't understand, you know. But I apprehend it. I'm using it right now. This sermon is stored in the cloud. I'm seeing it right here. I don't understand. But I'm apprehending it. Because I don't, I, don't, I don't comprehend gravity. But we're all apprehending it. And aren't you thankful? Right, exactly. Right. So, so, so we stop and we think about this idea. And it's just because I can't comprehend something doesn't necessarily mean that I can't apprehend something. And so throughout Scripture, there are a number of images that are used, and used to, to kind of uh, symbolize the, the Holy Spirit and help us to kind of grasp something that, that is sometimes hard to, to hold on to. And so we think about the Holy Spirit and we go, what are the images that are associated? And we go, oh, well, we just heard some of them in the reading. And it's, it's wind and it's, it's tongues. And, it's, and there's other images throughout the Scripture. It's oil and then there's water. And, and, and then there's fire and then, there, and then there's a bird and it's kind of like a bird on fire it's a stop, that's the Mockingjay you're thinking about the Hunger Games, that's not it okay, Just, that's not the thing but it is the idea that, that, that this, this image and there's so a number of images and here's the thing, I can't have a relationship with oil I don't have a relationship with fire. I don't have a relationship with wind. And I don't have a relationship with with all of those things. But I can have a relationship and I can relate to a person. And so I can have a relationship with God the Holy Spirit. You can have a relationship with God the Holy Spirit. When God the Father, through God the Son, 
by the indwelling power of the presence of the Holy Spirit of God comes to dwell and live inside of you as a follower of Jesus, then you can be in relationship with God himself. What I hope to do in the time that I have left is simply this, ask a question, and hopefully we'll begin to see a little bit of the answer. And the answer uh, the question goes like this, what's he up to? What does the Holy Spirit want to do in your life? What is the Holy Spirit attempting to produce in your life? And so I would begin with just a simple illustration that there was a pastor one day in church. And, you know, the pastor, you know, it was back when the, back when the pastor used to, like, gather all the kids down front. Remember the children's sermon? Sometimes you got more out of the children's sermon than you did the actual sermon. It's okay. It's true. You know, it, it is. And that's because they were simple and they were only trying to say one thing, you know. And so the pastor got down there and he said, inside this bag that I have, I have something magical. And you guys are going to love this. And he pulled out a pair of magic gloves. And he began to describe the gloves. And he was saying, that I've seen these gloves do all sorts of things. And they're absolutely amazing. And they pick stuff up and they carry things. And, and watch. And he took them and he threw them down. And he said, well, I'm terribly sorry. I have no idea what happened. He said, I've seen them pick up stuff before. He said, let's try it again. And they tried again. And, and finally, of course, the kids are like, you have it, your hands inside. Yeah, right? And so, I mean, because, you know, that's, that's what children sound like. And so, and so he said, you know, kids, you're right. And so he did. And so he put the gloves on. And it was just this idea. And it, was a, it became a simple illustration that helped people to understand that gloves without hands inside are pretty useless Just like a Christian's life not filled with the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit giving them the ability to move and to go and to do and to lift and to do whatever it is. This is what the filling of the Spirit of God is like in our own life. It's the empowerment of our lives. You know, as a pastor, I've seen a lot of things in my ministry. I've seen people who have come to faith in Jesus Christ and they, they worship the Lord and, and they, they get baptized and, and they join the church and they, they experience the presence of God in powerful ways. And I've seen people who have been freed from addictions. You know, sometimes it's miraculously and then other times it's through the long, slow process of rehab. I've seen marriages that have been turned back from the brink of divorce. I've seen people who thought that the building would collapse if they walked inside. It didn't. You know, engage God and, and worship the Lord and sing praise to Him and, you know, hear the Scripture and then serve in ministry. And, I mean, I've seen some amazing things happen in ministry. I've seen people healed physically. I've seen people healed emotionally. I've seen people healed in other, other ways in their life. And it's just, it's, it's fascinating. And then there's smaller miracles. Like the person who discovers their spiritual gifts or the person who gives their life to to service of God and and the person who chooses to step up and they serve in some small, out-of-the-way, unseen space in the church that they never thought they'd ever join in or be a part of. And they do. And they they give themselves away and they discover joy unthinkable. I've seen young couples who, you know, (laughs) through fear and trepidation decided to trust God with tithe money that they felt like they didn't have. And then, you know, with, with great fear and, and angst, they'd write that check or they'd give online and, and they would do so. And then God would meet them in amazing ways. What is it that makes all of these things and so many other things possible? Well, I'll tell you what it's not. It's not the fact that, that the church has great programs or the church has such a talented staff or a church has like state-of-the-art facilities. It's none of those things. It's the indwelling power, person, and presence of the Holy Spirit of God. That's what sets people free. That's what enables people to serve. That's, that's, that's the guiding force. That's the power, if you will, in the life of the church. In fact, there's a small verse in a small book in the Bible in the Old Testament in Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6. We find these words, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. That's, that's how people's lives are changed. It's not by people's strength. It's not by their own power. It's not by their own might. They don't, they don't, they don't change themselves. Instead, how do, we, how do we move away from worry and fear and all that? And instead, we begin to embrace trust and, and see opportunity. How do we love people rather than allowing grudges to control our lives? It's by the power of the Spirit of God. This is, this, this is what the Holy Spirit is up to. What's He wanting to do? What's He wanting to produce, if you will, or birth within our life, Alan Coppage, who's an author and a seminary professor, says these words. 
The purpose of releasing the Holy Spirit in your life is holiness. If God the Father is the one who sets the standard for holy character and God the Son is the living demonstration of what holiness looks like in human form, then God the Holy Spirit is the one who actually makes it possible in our lives. So what God longs to see happen in your life is for you to become more holy than you already are. I'll never forget the seminary professor, uh, rather the seminary president of Asbury when I was there. I, he was preaching one sermon. And I, I only remember just a few things that, that he ever said. But here's one of the things I do remember. He said this. He said, you're as holy as you want to be. And I just remember hearing those words going, ooh. Because it began to send me into the soul-searching moment of am I, am I really as holy as I want to be? And I think the answer at the end of the day is absolutely. And so the Holy Spirit's task oftentimes is to work on us and in us. But here's how he does it. He does it from the inside out. God is so much less concerned about cleaning up the outside of your life as much as he wants to clean out the inside of your life. Right? Like this is, this is it. And here's the thing. Here's the thing. You know this because you're smart. You have a choice. You can either cooperate with the work of God in your life and you can say yes to the work of the Holy Spirit or you can go, yeah, no thanks. And you can stiff arm him and you can hold him at a distance. And you can, like we talked about last week, we said if our life is, is God's house, then, then we're going to let God have free reign of the house. And, if, and if, that's, if, it's, if our life is his house, then he can rearrange the furniture. But there's this one closet over here that we just don't want to let him into. And so this is, this is oftentimes characteristic of our lives. And so we do have the ability to say yes to the Spirit of God, but we also have the ability to say no to the Spirit of God. But make no, cho- make no mistake, you have a choice. You can say yes, you can say no. He is the power source in your life that allows this to happen. The Associated Press picked up a story of a gentleman by the name of Leslie Puckett. He lived in Kentucky. He walked out to his car one, one morning, started his car, stuck the ignition in, the key, in, in, the, in there, and turned it over, and it just got nothing, just nothing. Turned it back, it's like, oh, man, the battery's dead. Turned it again, nothing. Got out, popped the hood, raised the hood, only to discover that somebody had indeed stolen his motor. <laughs> I would submit to you the following idea, that our life is a lot like a car without a motor. If we don't have the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, our life is a car with no motor or a glove with no hand. What good is this? No good. I mean, it's just there. It's not doing anything. In the upper room, Jesus talks. I mentioned this last week. He talks more about the Holy Spirit in that part of John, like John 14 through 16. So in John 15, we find these words, When the Counselor comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. See, a primary role of the Holy Spirit is that he bears witness to. He testifies to. He points to the work of Jesus. So in a supernatural way, the Holy Spirit speaks to people's hearts about who Christ is. Again, in John chapter 16, just a couple of verses. I assure you, Jesus says, that it's better for you that I go away. If I don't go away, the companion won't come to you. But if I go, I'll send him to you. When he comes, he will show the world it was wrong about sin, righteousness, and judgment. So Jesus, again, like I said a moment ago, Jesus has to go away. He's got to. The sun can't be everywhere at once. But the Holy Spirit can, and He will be, and He will be in us. The word that we use in the original language of the New Testament, which as you know is Greek, the word for companion in this particular translation, or in some translations it may say helper, or it could say counselor, or it could say uh, comforter, or advocate in some translations is the Greek word, what's called paraclete. And a paraclete is uh, used to describe the actions of someone else. So it means someone who is summoned, someone who is called alongside, someone who's called to render or give aid, to help. It's a word that also indicates that someone is called to help or who pleads the case or the cause of another in front of legal counsel. If you've ever had to go to court or if you ever have to go to court, you want someone who will plead your case 
to someone else. You want an advocate. You want someone who will come alongside you to assist, to help, to aid, to counsel, and to comfort. And in the absence, listen to me, in the absence of the physical presence of God, that's Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes to us. He comes alongside us to be our companion. He comes alongside us to be our helper and our encourager and our comforter. And he comes to live where? In us. Right. This is, this, is what, this is what he comes to do. But what's he come to do once he's inside of us? Well, what's he come to do? He comes to produce fruit. He comes to produce, he comes to produce the character of Christ. This is the Father's goal. The Father's desire is for you to look like the Son. At the end of the day, that's it. He wants you to look like, in terms of your character, he wants you to look like Jesus. Why? Because Jesus isn't here anymore. But he is through the Holy Spirit in you. So you get to represent Jesus. Yay! Well, you should. I mean, because this is it. This is our task. This is, and if the world needs anything, it needs an accurate representation of who Jesus is. Right? Like the world, does, the world looks at the church and goes, no, no, I'm good. The world looks at Christians and goes, really? No, <laughs> thanks anyhow. I'm down. Don't, don't, don't need any of that. And I want to say, I don't know if they're getting the right image and the right view of who Christ is through his church. And, th- and th- this is on us. Have you ever gone to the grocery store or maybe your local fruit stand or wherever it is that you buy produce and you're there and you're, you're looking and you're buying produce and, and you're turning it over and you're thumping melons and you're looking for all the bad places. But have you ever bought produce and got it home only to discover that you missed one? And you're like, oh man. And you turn it over and there you're wondering, you're like, how did I miss this soft spot on this zucchini? Right? Or you see this one place on a tomato that the skin's gotten a little wrinkly and it's kind of soft. And, you know, or there's this, it's right around the core of the apple that's starting to turn brown. You know? And you look at that and you go, that's not what a healthy tomato looks like. That's not what a healthy apple looks like, right? And I want to submit to you the following idea that sometimes the world is a good judge And he goes, that's not what a Christian should act like. That's not how a Christian should behave. Because what we need to be doing is producing fruit. Jesus would tell us it would be fruit that would last. It wouldn't go bad. Right? So Paul the Apostle, under the inspiration of the Spirit, writes to a church in a region known as Galatia. And in Galatians chapter 5, if you're, and we're, you're about to see the good stuff, if you want to see the bad stuff, back up to about verse 19, the Holy Spirit produces a different kind of fruit. Unconditional love, joy, peace, patience, kind-heartedness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You won't find any law opposed to fruit like this. Those of us who belong to the anointed one, that's Christ, have crucified our old lives and put to death the flesh and all the lusts and desires that plague us. See, the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the church, that's us. We're the church, gang. Not a building. The people. This is just a gathering spot. The work of God in the life of the church is to empower our lives to reflect the character of Jesus to a watching world. How you doing on that? Don't answer. And then to continue and then to continue the ministry of Jesus. That's what we get the privilege of doing. And so that's what we do. Why do you, why do you think we do summer sack lunch? We will continue the ministry of Jesus. Why do you think we do vacation Bible school? He said, Jesus didn't do vacation Bible school. No, but he did say, let the little children come to me. Right? I mean, this is it. This is why we engage in mission and ministry. Why do we send mission teams? Because the early church sent mission teams and commissioned people and sent them out. This, this is what we do. This is, this is who we are as a church. This is the work that we do. In 1983, a fellow by the name of John Scully had quit his job at PepsiCo after a conversation that he had with Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs, who was, you know, then working with Apple, and Apple had been on, had been around for a little while, but they were still relatively new to some degree. And he was asking him to come and be president of Apple. And it was a radical step, and he had an uncertain future. It was incredibly risky. And Steve Jobs turned to John in 1983 and asked him one question. He said this, again, he works with Pepsi. He said, do you want to sell sugared water for the rest of your life? Or do you want a chance to change the world? 
And so this is a moment when, when he was faced with this radical, life-changing moment. It was a decision. It was a crossroad moment. I want to put you in front of the idea that I think you're going to encounter a crossroad moment in your life. Like there's going to come a time when you're going to have a moment when God's going to encounter you. And God is going to say, do you want to continue to do church as usual? Do you just want nice, safe Christianity? Do you just want spiritual pablum, if you will? Or are you ready for the fire and the presence and the wind and the power of the spirit of the living God that you can't control and you can't tame? Or are you ready for, for something in a move of God in a powerful way that nobody would have ever fathomed or thought about? And I think, I think, I think God's going to put you in a space like that. In fact, I hope he does. And I hope he makes you insanely uncomfortable because he will. Because this is what the Spirit of God does. It was in that moment in the upper room when, when, when the Holy Spirit had descended upon the disciples and they had waited and they prayed for 10 days and, and they were bathed in prayer. And Peter stands up and he preaches a three-minute sermon and 5,000 people, I mean just thousands and thousands and thousands of people are saved under the, under the anointing of the Spirit of the living God. And then now that the Spirit is there, and the Spirit has empowered their mission and their ministry. He's getting ready to send them out. And they're getting ready to go. This is, this is what makes the work of the church happen. Without the infilling and the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, the church is nothing more than a religious treadmill. It just is. If the Holy Spirit doesn't fill Sugar Hill United Methodist Church and empower its ministries, I'm out. You should be out too. Because you shouldn't want to be in a place where the Holy Spirit is not. And I'm here to tell you, He's here. And He's in you, 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 and He's in you. And if you're a Christian believer, He's in you. Like we said last week, the, the question isn't, do you have the Holy Spirit? The greater question is, does the Holy Spirit have all of you? But I want you to remember one idea, and it's this one. Just because I can't comprehend the Holy Spirit doesn't mean I can't apprehend the Holy Spirit. I would submit to you the following idea that probably what we really need, if we're just going to be honest with one another, is we need, well, we need to have happen to us what happened on the first Pentecost, which was the fact that the disciples were apprehended by God. They were apprehended by the Holy Spirit of God because without Him, without the Holy Spirit gang, you're nothing but a car without a motor or a glove without a hand. But with him, it makes all the difference in the world. You think about it. Amen. Let's pray. As our servers come forward to lead us to the table, let's pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you that you meet us in this moment. You meet us at the table. We thank you, Lord, that just like on that first Pentecost day, you poured out your Spirit. You are longing to pour out your Spirit on us today. That God, in this space, right here, right now, we ask that you would fill us with yourself. Fill us, Almighty God, to overflowing. God, I pray that you would fill us, but not just partially and not just halfway. But God, I pray your Holy Spirit would fill us and it would, it would pour out the windows of our life. God, it would flood the house and it would come out the chimney. In Jesus' name. God, that you would pour out your presence over your church. God, forgive us when we'd rather choose safe, predictable religion instead of the overwhelming anointing of your Spirit. So come, Jesus. Bathe your people in the name of Christ. We give thanks and praise for broken bread, for a Savior who said, take and eat, for a poured out cup, for the Redeemer who said, take and drink. And so, Lord, that's what we'll do. On this day, God, we ask that you would make this be for us the body and blood of Christ so that we can be the body of Christ poured out by the blood of Christ, we give you thanks and praise. 
in the name of Jesus.